ng Sunday night. Nandi any days for and Sunday night. So we just hope that at the end of this, what's going to be very enjoyable for me uh, and I think for me, I can be session, you won't go back uh, having these two or something. I find it in the day. We haven't prepared as to what we're going to say. And we thought that would be the best thing is to, is to, to talk very largely about um, not Gandhi the person. Uh, we're not really interested in buying the details of Gandhi the person. Uh, those are available, those are important in themselves. Uh, but try and see what possibilities and what potential Gandhi has for our times. And if Gandhi has no potential and possibility for our times, Gandhi then is um, not something to worry about. Uh, the fact that we worry about Gandhi, the fact that these questions about or whether Gandhi is relevant or not, it's coming off. We still have debates about uh, whether there were three bullets in his body or four, uh, uh, um, whether he is the janitor in chief of this country or not. Uh, there are all these questions which is which coming up, which also tell you that there is a possibility that Gandhi is something that bothers us. Um, and, and one of the reasons, I think, why he bothers us is um, that we see him not only as our past, but possibly, possibly, as one of the futures which is available to us. Uh, and Vinay is somebody who's really worked extensively on uh, thinking about multiple futures. And then that was, you know, uh, he and, and, and uh, my teacher and uh, his collaborator, Ashish Nandu, really talked through some of these very difficult questions about, about how do we open up futures? And so I'm going to begin by, in some ways, you know, um, asking you know, about some of these possibilities. And we know that Gandhi in his life and in our life has not been an easy presence. Um, never been an easy man um, to deal with. Um, certainly not easy if you were the caretaker of his real estate. Very difficult. Um, um, and and uh, um, um, like all landlords, he's very demanding. But um, what's been happening is that uh, we're getting multiple narratives around Gandhi, which is a good thing. Uh, multiple narratives by themselves are not something to be to be shunned. Uh, it tells us that that we're thinking about him in in more ways than one. But when I, as you know, um, in the last, let's say, about a decade or so, um, we've begun to reassess parts of Gandhi's life, um, expressing our deep disappointment with various parts of Gandhi's past. Um, we've been disappointed about his South African life. We've been disappointed about his Indian life. We've been disappointed about his um, fractured dialogue with Dr. Ambedkar. A uh, large number of Muslims in our country feel alienated from him still. Um, so there's been this narrative being uh, um, created in different parts, but it has now begun to come together, um, which is to say that he is a very flawed man, which by itself is very nice. Uh, I mean, um, if he were perfect, can you imagine the kind of burden that can, that Gandhi would have been uh, on, on on even people like you and I who have um, you know deep affinity with who he was and what the way he thought and what he tried to do? Uh, but how do you see this global discourse on Gandhi? Um, where is it coming from? Where is it taking our understanding of Gandhi? And is it making Gandhi less and less available to us as a society? And not just us in India, certainly in India, but elsewhere, because there are people and communities um, which are str struggling to expand their idea of freedom. And Gandhi could be a friend there. Instead, he is somebody who is vilified. Um, right. 
Well, uh, let, me, let me first begin by uh, expressing my thanks to uh, Subodh uh, and his family uh, for the invitation and for the wonderful hospitality. Um, uh, let me uh, begin on a more general note, and then I'll come directly to the question of the multitudes of Gandhi that we have, um, and how we might begin to think creatively with Gandhi. Uh, what I want to do first is to first, uh, I'm very glad that Tridip didn't use a word which is always used uh, in such conversations, um, and that is the relevance of Gandhi. I don't want to speak about the relevance of Gandhi. Uh, that is a task of the government of India. They've been doing that for 50 years, and the thousands of seminars they've hosted on the relevance of Gandhi, the intention of each seminar is to bury Gandhi in the ground. So let's forget about the relevance of Gandhi, number one. Number two, I, I think at this particular juncture, and this will help us move a little bit closer to what Tridip has already asked, I'd like to make a distinction between the idea of India as a nation state and India as a civilization. The two are very different entities. In my judgment, the future of India, in many ways, can also be described as a tussle between the two. Uh, 15, 16 years ago, I wrote a book called Of Cricket, Guinness, and Gandhi, Essays on Indian History and Culture. And the whole intent of that book was to demonstrate this tension between these two ideas. Because when we think about Gandhi, we are immediately confronted with an enormous number of anomalies. The one that has a direct bearing to what I'm speaking about is that Gandhi was doubtless what you would call a nationalist. That is that he was someone who advocated for self-determination. We won't get into the complication of all the things he meant by self-determination and self-reliance because we know from Hind Swaraj and from a host of other writings that Gandhi meant much more than independence from colonial rule, right? But what is the anomaly? The anomaly is that Gandhi is a nationalist, and yet there is no nationalist I can think of, either in India or in any other place, that strove for decolonization, who was less committed to the idea of a nation state. This is the anomaly that we have to think about. Just as there was no one who used the Ramayana, or more particularly, the Ram Charitmanas, because we have to make a distinction between the Ramayana and the Ram Katha, as we know, and yet, who at the same time was very clear that if there are verses in the Ram Charitmanas which are offensive to the litmus test of your moral conscience, you must reject those verses. Now, in similarly, in every respect, we can think of these kinds of anomalies. But to go to the question here, what I'm suggesting is that I think the fundamental problem, and I think Gandhi alerted us to that, is that we are more and more entrenched in the idea of the nation state. We have forgotten that India is a civilization as well. And civilizations, not that they are not without their problems, and I'm well aware of the fact that even the word civilization has its problems, as Gandhi himself pointed out quite ironically and satirically in Hind Swaraj. But nevertheless, it is very clear that civilizations are much more capable of accommodating dissent. They're much more ecumenical and pluralistic than this thing that we call the nation state. The nation state is probably the most hazardous product of modernity. And I think Gandhi was well aware of that. So when we begin to think of Gandhi, I want to suggest in a general vein, I think we have to think contrapuntally. That is what we have to always think against the grain in trying to understand what Gandhi was trying to think through and what he was trying to do. Now to go directly to your question, Tridip, I think as you know, as well as I do, it's, it's a very vast question because Gandhi is a person whose legacy, whatever it may be, um, is in some respects universal. 
uh, in some respects, I say, and I say in some respects I add that caveat because, quite frankly, you know, the Gandhi that you and I and some others might know uh, is not only the Gandhi who was a, the architect, real or alleged, of the Indian independence movement, the founder of the idea of Satyagraha, uh, an exponent of Ahimsa, because if you really say, okay, the Gandhi that is taken up by people all over the world, it's the Gandhi who is showing us the path to nonviolent resistance, right? If I put it in very crude terms. But the Gandhi that I know is far more complex. A person who had a fundamental critique of modern industrial civilization, who had a critique of what you might describe as very narrow conceptions of the self, a, a person who had a whole ethical framework for thinking through virtually every problem that you can think about. Why did he spend so much time on the question of toilets? Right? It's so if you're, if you're looking at people in the United States or South Africa or anywhere else who have taken up Gandhi, they're completely unaware of all of that. They have taken a very small portion of Gandhi. That has to do with this idea of nonviolent resistance and essentially encapsulated him within that. And of course, I'm by no means suggesting that that's unimportant, but I'm suggesting that that gives us an extraordinarily partial view. Because the question would be whether the Gandhi that persists, if indeed there is a Gandhi that persists in the years to come, is going to be a Gandhi that is going to be a Gandhi who alerted us to all kinds of things in his own incipient fashion, including, for example, something such as climate change. Now, I think Gandhi had a world view on the, on the environment, on ecology, all of that. Right? So we have to begin with that consideration first, I would say. Now, there are several different segments. I'll just address a couple of them briefly, and then I'd like to pose a question to you as well which is, let's take very briefly um, a couple of questions. One is, as you've said, there has been what we might describe as some kind of reassessment of Gandhi over the course of the last decade. Um, I might want to push it back further. I think it's become more intensified because we have to remember that Gandhi had his critics from day one. I mean, you read someone like M. N. Roy, writing in the 1920s, or you read Shomyendra Nath Tagore, a member of the venerated Tagore family, and what he had to say. They were extraordinarily critical of Gandhi. And this is 10 years before Ambedkar, mind you. Okay, 10 years before Ambedkar. They were extraordinarily critical of Gandhi. In fact, M. N. Roy wrote very clearly that all that Gandhi offered us was moonshine, you know. Right? And of course, he came from a certain vantage point. I mean, he was arguing from a kind of a Leninist point of view, so we can understand why he had the particular view that he did on Gandhi. But this is simply to say that there has been a critical gaze turned on Gandhi for a very long period of time. When the Attenborough film came out, uh, and deservedly it needed to be critiqued, the problem is not just Attenborough, the problem is that we Indians don't know how to write biographies. We can only write hagiographies. That's all we can do. I don't think the idea of a critical biography actually exists in the Indian imagination for all kinds of reasons that I won't get into at the moment. But, but the, the, whatever the problems may have been, you know, the, there was a virulent stream of criticism against Gandhi, not so much even the film that came out in the wake of the Attenborough film, which was 1982. So the history of this really goes back quite some time. But, in the last decade or so, it has been intensified because there's been a reassessment, uh, for example, by uh, two scholars, both of whom actually happen to be friends of mine. And, and in the Gandhian spirit, we've retained our friendship, even though I fundamentally disagree with their reading of Gandhi. Years in South Africa, I'm speaking about a book by Gulam Vahed and Ashwin Desai, uh, Stretcher Bearer of Empire. Uh, there's also been, of course, a reassessment um, th this, of course, has been taking place over a long period of time, but it's become more intensified. That is the Dalit critique uh, and the new editions that have come out uh, of some of Ambedkar's works published by Navayana and so on. That's, I think, exactly what Tridip is sort of uh, adverting to. Now, I think it is important that we face up to these criticisms. That might sound like a platitude. The fact of the matter is it isn't because most of the 
people who call themselves Gandhians have never quite been willing to do that. You know, they've never really been willing to do that, is to face up to all of these criticisms. Uh, and I think the first person who would have addressed all of this would have been Gandhi himself. I mean, that's the most extraordinary thing, that Gandhi is his own most rigorous critic that I can think of. When I hear someone tell me, I mean, someone I was speaking to a few days ago, a very intelligent, highly educated woman, the first thing she told me was, yeah, but you know, Gandhi used to beat up his wife. I said, really, he used to beat up his wife? I know, the, I know the instance she's referring to. She's referring to the instance which Gandhi himself mentioned, by the way. I mean, Gandhi himself is a person who alerts you to this, and this is an incident where, you know, he drags her out. This had to do with, you know, the chamber pots. I'm not going to go over the whole uh, incident. It's narrated in the autobiography, right? I mean, in each of these instances, Gandhi himself is his own most rigorous critic, right? Of course, this doesn't now address the more substantive question, which is that, so how legitimate, but that's a very long, complicated question. For example, what do we do with the Dalit critique of Gandhi? Right? And I say this is very complicated because, number one, it hovers around the idea of something called caste. Now, what is this thing called caste? And you know, the circles that, we, that I move around in, the kind of scholarship that I'm, I'm aware of, we don't at all take for granted that we can use the interpretive frameworks we have today to understand something called caste. There is a long history of the Jati Puranas, and every community in India has these, every single community. And when you start to look at these Jati Puranas, you arrive at a very different understanding of what the institution called caste is. There has been a substantial body of work which has put seriously into question even the most commonly accepted frameworks that we think about when we think of caste. Right? And before we can get into Gandhi's own view, we would have to really understand how he was thinking through and whether he was captive or not. In my judgment, he was not to what we might call the colonial understanding of caste. Because every time we look at the whole question in the going back to the 30s, you know, the, in fact, even going back to the whole question of temple entry, satyagras, and then of course the Pune Pact, Gandhi, Ambedkar, all of that, we'd have to really fundamentally think through what we understand by something called caste. Now, there is a book that's been written very recently, and I'll stop with that because we could take up each of these. For example, his experience in South Africa, his relationship to, to Africans. Uh, I, I might mention just one thing there before posing a question to you. Similarly, the feminist critique. You know, every constituency in India loves to hate Gandhi. Every constituency, whether it's the Dalits, the feminists, the modernists, the constitutionalists, the Marxists, you name it. And the Kantians. Everyone. OK? Just as every constituency, including groups such as nudists and vegetarians, have their own Gandhi. You're going to talk about the multitudes of Gandhi, it's almost endless, I can tell you. You know, they, they are, you, you, you know I'll give you a very simple illustration. Um, when I teach a course on Gandhi, so I also have, a, I have an extensive blog, and, and people write extensive comments. So very recently, a student of mine posted a long <coughs> entry where he pointed out to me, and I was unaware of this, despite all the years that I've been reading on Gandhi and all of that, and writing on the US, because I write extensively on American politics, that in the United States, the anti-abortion lobby considers Gandhi one of his heroes. The anti-abortion lobby. They may be wholly ignorant of Indian history, everything else, but they venerate. Gandhi. He told me when he was growing up in the deeps in, in uh, Arkansas, okay, in the church he went to, the, the pastor would constantly speak about the evils of abortion and then would project images of Gandhi and quotes from Gandhi about the sanctity of human life, all of that. Now here, here's talking about the multitudes of Gandhi, right? 
Because of course, then what else did they know about Gandhi? I would want to know. For example, their aggressive methods of targeting doctors who run abortion clinics, the same group. Would Gandhi have approved of that? Did, do they think Gandhi would have approved of that kind of terrorism, if we want to call it that? Because you know, there have been doctors who have been killed in the US for performing abortion. You know, right? So it, it, it gets very complicated. Right? But the two things briefly, one is that I was adverting very, and I didn't finish the thought there, I was adverting to a book that was written recently. It's called Gandhi Against Caste. But the author of this book, Nishikant Kolge, basically uh, the argument is very simple. I mean, there's no real discussion of the institution of caste and what are the problems in interpreting caste. But what he says is that, and he comes from a Dalit background himself, is that if you look at Gandhi's views from the 20s through the 40s until his assassination, they change. And from his point of view, this was a strategic accommodation. But strategic here is not to be read as opportunist. That Gandhi genuinely, at least from the point of view of strategically understanding the place of caste and its relationship to what he was trying to do, these views change. So for example, the whole question of inter-caste dining. He didn't really take a position on that in the 20s, but much later, of course, we did. We know that, right? Inter-caste marriages. In fact, initially, you could say he was opposed to it. But then he begins to adopt positions which are, to put it mildly, very sympathetic to this. Right? So that would be one way to tackle it if one wanted to. And finally, on the question of Gandhi's South African experience. Now, I would want to know from the critics who have written on this one or two things. This is aside from the usual answers that have already been given by people to the critics of Gandhi, such as the fact that he was, quote, a man of his times, you know, then he used the word kafir, he was only doing what many others were doing, etc., etc. That doesn't really interest me that much. Uh, I think it is true to argue that Gandhi outgrew his views on many of these things. But what I want to know is this. In 1934, I think many of you, most of you, will be completely unaware of this incident. It's, it's narrated in the collected works of Mahatma Gandhi. The person who is fundamentally involved in it himself wrote a whole book. I'm referring to a, an African-American theologian by the name of Howard Thurman, who led a four-person delegation, including himself, his wife, and two other people, who came to India They spent and Sri Lanka. They spent six weeks. The purpose eventually was to meet with Gandhi, and they spent the last week with Gandhi in Varda. Now, during the course of this conversation, they talk about Ahimsa, its future. And Gandhi says, in that conversation, look it up in the collected works. Now, you find the same conversation in Howard Thurman's autobiography as well. He says, I dare say that I think that the next great step in taking Ahimsa forward will be among your people in the United States. He says that unequivocally. Gandhi had a very warm relationship with African Americans for four and a half decades. Most people think the story begins and ends with Martin Luther King. Quite to the contrary, the greatest African American intellectual of his day, W.E.B. Du Bois, wrote the first piece by an African-American on Gandhi. And for the next 30 years, he wrote 16 lengthy articles, all extraordinarily admiring. And he knew what Gandhi had done in South Africa. He had read the autobiography later on, Satyagraha in South Africa, you know. And from W.B. Du Bois, you go to people like, obviously, Howard Thurman, Benjamin Mays, huge range of people. Martin Luther King comes at the very end of that. Now, none of these people was, because, you know, some of the critiques of Gandhi's years in South Africa and what he said, that's all to be found in Satyagraha in South Africa as well. It's all there. 
They had all read this book, but they understood. Why isn't it, why isn't it the case that they, as people of African origin, have a different reading of Gandhi, where they, they understand that, yes, this is what Gandhi was doing there. These might have been the limitations. There might have been strategic reasons why he didn't include the struggle of Africans. Right? So I, I think that there are, in all of these, all of the critiques, I think we have to face them. But I think that Gandhi was sufficiently self-reflective about what he was doing, you know, I would suggest. Now, Tridip, I would like to narrow, go from the universal, as it were, to the provincial. All right? I take the liberty of asking you this fundamental question, and you can, you know, perhaps if it's articulated too sharply, uh, because it includes a statement of sorts, you, you should obviously feel free to disagree. I have had a very difficult time with the Gujarati perception and reading of Gandhi. Right? It is possible to argue from my standpoint that the Gujarati middle class in particular would like to banish Gandhi from their imagination altogether, completely exorcise him. So my question really to you is very simply this. From the 80s, let's say, down to the present day, uh, I mean, there's a history of uh, what it's called communal riots in Ahmedabad, which is earlier, and think back to the 60s, of course. Um, but, I, but I'm picking the 80s more because at that time, then, across India, not just in Gujarat, you also begin to see the ascendancy of the Hindu right, you know, right? Um, leading up to, of course, the destruction of the Babri Masjid. So from that time on to the present, uh, how would you describe the changes in the Gujarati middle class view of Gandhi, number one? Would you agree, number two, that there is this, as I said, banishment of Gandhi? And how would one assess that, right? That is that, would one have to use historical, cultural, psychoanalytic categories to think through? because? It is a fact. I mean, that the people who are now in the present political dispensation guiding our futures here, many of them are Gujaratis, you know, right? So, and, and I think that notwithstanding all the overt platitudes from the government, uh, I think we know exactly where they stand on Gandhi. When you look at the worship of Savarkar and Golwalkar, uh, and the declaration that the assassin of Gandhi is a Deshbhakt. I think we know exactly where they stand on this. So how would you assess Gandhi's relationship to Gujarat and the Gujarat? I mean, I'm, I'm ready to take the entire blame, right? So uh, uh, it's very difficult being a Gujarat these days. Um, <laughs> One, um, one correction, um, the incident about 2002 actually did not take place. Okay. Uh, uh, fortunately, did not take place. It could have taken place. So I'm saying I'm not denying that potentiality. There are two reasons. One, that the Sabarmati Ashram does not have a gate. Yes. Right? Yes. So, uh, yeah. um, so right. the fact that the gates could be, and the architect is sitting right here, so uh, he would bear me out that he doesn't have a gate which is blockable. Uh, uh, two, but then, did take something take place much worse, not in 2002, 1969. Um, there was a family um, called Imam Sahib Abdul Qadir Babazi. Uh, now, Imam Sahib actually uh, had nothing to do with Amrabad. Uh, Imam Sahib came with, from, with Gandhi from South Africa. Uh, he was one of those people who, who came back and became an Ashramite like he was in, in, in South Africa here. Um, and his family continued to live there uh, till 1969. And that family was attacked in 1969. Uh, the Imam, they had to finally vacate the Imam Manzil uh, uh, and, and move to safer areas. Um, so, so yes, we are capable of doing that. Um, 
has our relationship with Gandhi changed? Um, or has the middle class relationship with Gandhi changed? Yes and no. Uh, let's remember that Gandhi had a definitive, and Gandhi had a very definitive disenchantment with Gujaratis uh, in his lifetime. Uh, Gandhi left Ahmedabad in 1936. Last time he came to Ahmedabad was in 1936, after which he never came back to Ahmedabad. So last 12 years of his life, Gandhi does not step into the town called Ahmedabad. After 1939, Rajkot, mm. Gandhi does not enter what then was the cultural geographical area called Gujarat. Mm. Okay. So, so there, is, there is a deep unease that Gujarat, the Gujarati middle class has with him, uh, which, which predate uh, the recent ones. The reasons for these um, are two, largely two. One, Gandhi had a difficult relationship with something that Gujaratis like very much, which is money. Um, here is this yes. metropolis of Ahmedabad where the, um, right, and, and, and a mercantile community, Gandhi comes and says, can we rethink our relationship to private wealth and inheritance? And he begins to posit possibilities of a very different uh, that's one deep unease that Gujarat begins to have. Second, of course, is caste. Uh, what we should remember, and this is something that most uh, critiques of Gandhi on caste do not understand, is that Gandhi, in Guj by the Savarnas in Gujarat, particularly in Gujarat, was treated as an untouchable. Uh, even during the great Dandi march, uh, and, and this is something that, you know, you can imagine, that there is at one level this great upsurge, thousands walk with him, are moved by that act. But, in many villages, the house in which he was kept overnight, and, and there was a halt every night, that house would be burnt down, because that house was lived in by an untouchable. This is Dandi Marsh. And we know, uh, because we've been trying to trace every place where he lived, in many instances, he would be kept at the Kam Kachora, which is, which is something which belongs to everyone. In that sense, it's an open, neutral space that belongs to nobody. You can wash it away. It happened during his visits to Kutch. Uh, there would always be his adopted daughter, Lakshmi, with him, who came from a Dalit family. And, and therefore, uh, neither he nor Lakshmi uh, would be welcomed into homes. So there is this, there has been this very deep unease that there is. Also, we should, I should, rem I know, since we are um, um, talking about um, my kind of people, we should realize that the thing that hurt Gandhi most was invented in Gujarat, which is that if you stop him from offering a prayer, it would hurt him the most. We know that during the last days of his life, every day the prayer would be interrupted. Mm -hmm. He would be told not to take the name of Allah. Right? And he would stop the prayer and said, if I can't take the name of Allah, there is no meaning for prayer for me, I will not. I will not pray. Where did it begin? The first prayer meeting of his life, which is disrupted, is in his own town, Rajkot, 1939. The reason why he doesn't really go back to Rajkot is that he felt deeply vitiated by that entire act. So we've had, the Gujarati middle class has had a difficult relationship with him. He's also had very difficult relationship with us, and that's why this very definitive turning away. What has really happened, but at the same time, large sections of Gujarat, the Gujarati intellectuals, leaders, leaders of community, of business, um,
did engage with him and did engage with him fruitfully. So what we find uh, a new kind of trusteeship models emerging in Ahmedabad and well, are also due to, to that engagement. Um, literary production of a certain kind happened around his community, Vidya Beat, the ashram, um, and the presence was deeply felt. That presence um, begins to go away by 1960. Literary works, uh, I'm not saying that these are works which talk about, this is not a poem about Gandhi that you need to write, it's not a compulsory thing, or a painting that you need to do. But um, some of the ideas which had begun to influence literary imagination, uh, the way Gujarati language itself was used, uh, all of that begins to turn away from that period of from 1915 to 1945. So the, the intellectuals of Gujarat, both in the literary imagination, um, I think the artistic world, begins to turn away from, from Gandhi by 1960s. Politically, we've begun to turn away from him. Uh, but I think by 1969, mm -hmm. uh, uh, any notion of collective nonviolence is given up, in Gujarat at least. 1969s were um, the most horrible riots uh, that um, of the 20th century. Then we, of course, bettered it. We are very progressive people. Um, uh, um, always move a step ahead. Uh, so yes, there has been a very active banishment of Gandhian imagination. Also, the fact is that part of, well, not part, I think a substantial um, reason for this also lies with Gandhian institutions. Um, some of the most enduring institutions that he hoped to create were created in Ahmedabad. Sabarmati Ashram, the Harijan um, Ashram Trust, Navjeevan, Gujarat Vidya Peet, uh, Majur Mahajan Sang, all of which survive today. Nothing in our country in that sense uh, comes to an end. Uh, but even in 1936, in Gandhi's presence, at the convocation of Gujarat Vidya Beat, the mayor of Ahmedabad spoke of Vidya Beat in the past tense. It, 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 I mean, it, it is not an error. Gandhi actually gets up during his later intervention and says, why one should not refer to Vidya Pit in the past. So there is something which had begun to happen, which then um, um, culminates into um, um, to these acts. Two things happen. Politically, we begin to arrive at a middle class consensus. Uh, we, began, we become politically a people who agree with each other. Um, and it's a very comforting thing that we like this thing called Vikas. Now, that is something that comes around the debates about the Narmada guy. The first very major middle class coming together on a state-sponsored idea of development happens around Narmada. The middle class of Gujarat is convinced that unless you have Narmada, you have no future. And anybody who opposes that idea of that dam or the possibility of the dam is not only anti development, is anti Gujarati. So, this idea that any form of dissent must be seen as a dissent against a people, a state, a culture, an imagination begins sometime in late 1970s, early 80s. By early 80s, it has begun to, to have. So we, began, we became a people who like consensus on large themes. And in that consensus, Gandhi has very little space. Because Gandhi would have actually come and forced us to question each of these notions of development. Um, not that Gandhi was not progressive, uh, that Gandhi had no sense of political economy, but Gandhi's notion of what constitutes good life was at, at a deep variance from what is the notion of good life that 
we in Gujarat have begun to, to, to aspire to. And therefore, Gandhi has to be placed outside. If you put Gandhi in that equation, that equation gets muddied. So we began to, to put him outside. So that's one thing that happens. The other thing that happens is that um, we also become free from certain obligations that we had towards Gandhi in the process. One was that you will not speak of your deep-rooted biases in public. Mm. Private, you did. Right? Um, but the caste riots begin in Gujarat. Let's, let's understand, the first major caste riots of modern India are not in Bihar or Uttar Pradesh where you would expect them to be, are in Gujarat. Mm. So, so this middle class, middle caste resentment against assertion against empowerment is expressed through very, very, very virulent, violent caste riots, 1983, 1986. Also, the other thing that um, we had more or less suppressed, and certainly suppressed after um, Gandhi's assassination, which would express itself in various ways, is our deep unease with the Muslim. Mm -hmm. Now, we began to become free about expressing our disenchantment, unease with both these categories. It would take different kinds of forms. It would take forms saying, oh, we are a predominantly vegetarian people and we do not want a non-vegetarian neighbor, which would include a good Parsi and a good Hindu as well. Well, most of you do not know that Gujarat, officially, 63% of Gujarat is non-vegetarian. 63, by census, and this is government data. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a data person. Right? Um, 63, and, but the image everywhere else, including um, you know, this pizza company, is that we are you know, a vegetable-eating community. No. Uh, but vegetarianism, of the middle caste and the upper caste and the middle classes is used as one way in by which we begin to segregate people. So yes, I mean, I think we've used every technique in the book and invented some more about expressing our biases. Um, and in that sense, we've freed ourselves from the burden that was coming. It's no longer possible, it's no longer necessary for me to say, um, I have a Muslim friend. I take pride in the fact that I don't know a Muslim. I have never been to a Muslim house. Uh, or that my daughter, uh, uh, you know, um, vomits at the sight of sausage or some such thing. I mean, none of which is true for me. I also drink black tea, which is uh, the most un Gujarati thing to do. Uh, 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 the land of milk and all of that. Mm. So there is there is that. So it's begun to happen. Finally, the political imagination. The Congress had no use for that for a very long time. Political use. Symbolically, he would be dusted out once in a while. Uh, but politically, they did not really know what to do. With the Gandhian institutions had become homes of subsidized imagination. If you take away subsidy from Khadi, there is no Khadi left in the KDIC. Uh, uh, the creativity of something like the Putan had turned into a land scam. Uh, this, all these landed good people like them gave, and then people like me made housing colonies on them uh, and never went to the peasantry. So, we, so the Gandhian institutions also became complicit in this. The only one exception to that has been this man called Narayan Desai, um, who after 2002 wrote this majestic biography of Gandhi. But more importantly, he adopted the oral form of Gandhi Katha, went from village to village, institution to institution, reminding us not of the life of Gandhi, but the possibility that Gandhi was. Uh, I, I think he was the sole exception among this large community that called itself uh, 
Kantians or Kantian intellectuals or activists or institutions. So yes, um, um, we are free. Most of us are free from the burden that was Gandhi. Um, um, it feels very nice. Um, we have a statue of liberty in Ahmedabad. <laughs> Not very tall, but we, you know, we are very good at building tall statues. So if we need to actually build uh, a very large statue, I mean, I mean, I'm not joking. There is a statue of liberty in Ahmedabad. Uh, please don't laugh. Okay. You know, um, uh, uh, it, actually, Ahmedabad has more New York towers than New York. Okay. Right. And uh, uh, so I think we've actually come a long way. Um, there is no, uh, there is no bemoaning that loss, and I don't think there is any recapturing of that imagination. Uh, these institutions will either become places of pilgrimage or tourism, more likely tourism. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then, uh, so that's what it is. Uh, we like it, we like a depoliticized Gandhi. <coughs> we do not like um, a Gandhi that is politically so edgy, so demanding, so demanding of, of uh, self-examination, so demanding of uh, correcting our ourselves. Um, we like a Gandhi who is, um, comes occasionally comes to clean our toilets. Right? And, and so um, I think that's what it's going to become. I mean, Gandhi in Gujarat, and which is going to be the national Gandhi. Exported to the rest, to, of, to, to the rest of the world is the yeah. janitor in chief. I mean, yeah. that's the most convenient Gandhi to have. Yeah. Uh, uh, you've given a wonderful explication of uh, Gandhi and what we might describe as a relationship to the Gujarati middle class and the Gujarati imagination. There are parts of that story which are true for other communities too. You know, if you read uh, uh, Joseph Lelaval, not, not that he was the first person mm -hmm. to talk about it, but he, he had a discussion of it which was unusually long, uh, that when Gandhi went um, to uh, what is now Kerala for the Vicom, uh, Satyagra, so to cut a long story short, when Gandhi visited the temple, after he left, the Brahmins had the whole temple cleaned and washed, you know, precisely because, as you had pointed out, and something that I don't think that people who, who uh, write critically on Gandhi and the Dalits, that Gandhi himself was viewed as an untouchable by the Savarnas, and not just in Gujarat, you know. Um, I think that, you know, each there are several like key words that each of them one could obviously go on for a long time. The whole idea of development, uh, money, uh, uh, you know, there's a, uh, I don't know if you ever knew him, uh, but there was a wonderful Indian doctor uh, who passed away a few years again, uh, ago, uh, Manu Kothari. Of course. Uh, in, yeah. in, in, in Mumbai. He was a good friend of mine. I wrote an obituary of him. and. Uh, in one of our last meetings, we had a long conversation. We were talking about Gujarat. And to cut a long story short, he asked me a question. He said, Vinay, what do you think is the holy book of the Gujaratis? I knew it was a trick question of some sort. So rather than giving me the whole, so basically the answer is the checkbook. <laughs> the checkbook. Okay. So you know, when you were talking about this relationship to money and that being one of the sources of tension, uh, un unquestionably, unquestionably the case, you know. Uh, so I, I, I think, and I think you're also right, uh, I mean, I think one could add elements uh, uh, to what you have described because, for example, uh, and here I have to say that I think uh, uh, Ashish Nandi, whom both you and I know very well, was I think one of the first persons to really talk about the politics uh, of uh, masculinity and femininity and why Gujaratis felt that Gandhi had effeminized them, you know, I think that that's actually an important part of the story too. Um, you know, in the very, in the, in the 2002 um, program, one of the most widely circulated texts was a three-page pamphlet called Autobiography, not biography, Autobiography of a Goat. Now, how does a goat write an autobiography, you ask yourself, uh, and what this was, was a ferocious sort of um, uh, text uh, for vegetarianism, basically, and basically it was being used as a template to demonize all those who were meat eaters, you know. So this uh, goat describes how, a baby goat describes how he's taken to the, you know, 
to the butcher, he's cut up into pieces, put on the plate for people to eat, all of that. I mean, it's quite graphic, you know. So I, I think that, you know, one could, one could certainly elaborate upon um, all of these uh, elements of the story. And in particular, I think, you know, uh, development, because I think the point that you've made, which I think we should all be sensitive to, because it's probably one of the most common sources of criticism of Gandhi is that Gandhi was basically anti-development. I think that's a complete misunderstanding. The problem, the word development is a problem because development is basically an ideology. Um, and it becomes an ideology in the post-World War II period. Um, you know, we used to speak of something called social change before that phrase more or less disappeared and then development became an ideology and it's an idea that was used to essentially rank and evaluate civilizations on a scale of hierarchy. Uh, so there were some fundamental problems uh, which persist, of course, with the whole ideology of development. And I think that Gandhi would have been a critic of the idea of development in its present form. Uh, Narmada being a very good illustration, and I think, again, you're, you're on, absolutely on spot that, that Narmada was one of these uh, points where uh, the Gujarati middle class became convinced that any criticism of this was a criticism both of the ideology of development um, uh, and of Gujarat itself, you know, right?